Good afternoon and welcome to Spirit of New Ministries. I'm Pastor Charles Young. So good to have you with me again today. Welcome to our Wednesday Bible study and we're going to get started with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day that you've given us. We thank you for the opportunity to open your word. Our prayer today is that you would speak to our hearts, enhance our understanding, and deepen our walk with you. For that, O oh Lord, we thank you in advance. And we look forward to what you want to speak and say to us this evening. We thank you, we love you, and we praise you. And it's this prayer that we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Again, welcome. So good to have you with me this afternoon. We are continuing in our study. Last Wednesday, we began a new study entitled Victory Over Despair, Discouragement, and Disappointment. And last week, we talked about despair and disappointment and discouragement and how those are very natural circumstances that we all face. Every now and again, we're going to face some despair. We're going to find ourselves being discouraged and oftentimes disappointed with life circumstances, things that go on, some that are within our control, and some that are beyond our control. But we also talked last week about how to manage these matters, how to get victory over despair, discouragement, and disappointment. And last week I gave you uh, scriptures, and we started with the main point, to trust God's plan for your life. And if we could learn how to trust God's plan for our lives, <coughs> excuse me, and just kind of walk through and work through the circumstances that we find ourselves in applying God's word, then we can gain victory over the situations in our lives that post and bring us discouragement, disillusionment, disappointment, and despair. So we're going to get started this evening, and we're going to look at some passages and we're going to look at a few things. Uh, first of all, I want to talk to you about three healthy principles for victory. As we're talking about getting victory over despair, disappointment, and discouragement, there's three basic points that I want to give you before we actually go into our main point tonight. First uh, principle for being able to gain victory, three healthy principles for gaining victory over our circumstances is point number one that grieving can be a healthy and beneficial process. You may need to spend some quiet time just being sad or just going into a spirit or a time of mourning. It's okay to do that. And to go into your mourning intentionally. If you're sad, if you're discouraged, if you're going through a difficult season in your life, it's okay to mourn. It's okay to go through a season of mourning. And for years, I tell people whenever you've suffered a loss uh, to not just kind of suck it up and just, you know, don't worry about it, don't, don't uh, be concerned. But I encourage people to mourn because mourning is a healthy, it's a good process. Uh, the proper kind of mourning can be very productive and it can provide closure. And all of us need to have closure when we're dealing with situations that produce despair, discouragement, and or disappointment. Now, point number two, sometimes we just need to cry. We just need to, and, and men can cry. It's not just for women, but that's a release. That's a way of just kind of getting that pressure off and just getting to a place of realizing that we're healthy because we've given ourselves the permission to release some things. We can release some things through crying, through exercising, through reading, through just having some quiet time. And the truth of the matter is we need to learn how to do whatever it is that helps us to release the sadness and release that disappointment, discouragement, or despair that we are experiencing. It's okay to just take some time in prayer. Uh, and maybe sometimes we might need to just get some help. It's okay to get counseling in the midst of the despair or disappointment or discouragement that we're encountering. And a lot of times people don't want to don't want to do uh, counseling. We don't want to share our thoughts or feelings or emotions with people. Uh, but God has trained professional counselors, especially Christian counselors, to help us to work through those circumstances and to work through those difficult times 
that we may be having in our lives. So it's good to do that. It's okay to do that. And then in doing so, that can help us to positively manage our grief. And then that can enable us to move on with our lives. And so point number three I want to bring to your attention is that disappointment was never meant to define us. Uh, discouragement, disappointment, despair, disillusionment, all of those things that we end up going through, and all of us go through them at some point, those were never meant to define our lives. It's not meant to hold us hostage, not meant to hold us down, or to cause us to go into the mire of depression. All of these things are from the adversary. They were not meant to define us. They were not meant to hold us hostage. And so don't give depression or despair, discouragement, disillusionment, disappointment. Do not give those things power over your life because God never intended it. God never purposed it. But God meant for you to live a life of freedom, of wholesomeness, and to be able to move beyond any despair, discouragement, or disappointment that you may encounter. So with that, we're going to go ahead and move on. And the first point that I want to give, this first or the second major point that I want to give for tonight, our second point in our study, the first point was to trust God's plan for your life. That was last week. And then tonight, our second point is engage in good grief. Engage in good grief. And grief is a necessity. We need to learn how to manage our grief. But grief doesn't always have to be a negative or a bad thing. Grief can be a positive thing if it's properly managed. Number one, we need to acknowledge that grief is a real thing. But then we also need to learn how to properly manage it. And we're going to talk about that tonight. So it's necessary for us to engage in what I call good grief. And when you look at the scriptures, it really helps to support that perspective. Our first passage tonight, join me in going to the Psalms. And we're going to be talking out of a, a lot of the Psalms tonight. We're going to have several passages out of the book of Psalms. Our first one can be found in chapter 22 and verse 24. And I'm going to be reading this passage out of the New International Version, the NIV. And so Psalm chapter 22, verse 24, it reads, For he has not despised or scorned the suffering of the afflicted one. He has not hidden his face from him, but he has listened to his cry for help. And God is the God who understands what we go through. He understands our circumstances, and therefore he has not despised or scorned the suffering of the afflicted one. God recognizes that Every now and again, we're going to find ourselves being afflicted. But God does not take a negative or dismissive perspective against the afflicted one. Those who are going through discord, uh, discord or disappointment, uh, discouragement, uh, disillusionment, when we go through those things, God does not just cast us off, but he embraces us and therefore he does not despise it. He doesn't scorn the one who is going through suffering, the one who is afflicted. But he, and he also does not hide his face, but he listens for the cry of help of those who are going through difficult times. God understands. He knows what we're going through, and he listens very intently to the cry for help of the afflicted one. And that's good news. That lets us know that God understands not only what we're going through, but he is also availing himself to help us when we're going through difficult seasons. The next passage can be found out of Psalm chapter 30 and verse 5, the B portion of verse 5, the 30th Psalm, verse 5, and the latter portion of that fifth verse. Now I'm reading from the New Living Translation, so it's going to read a little differently, but the point is still the same. And this is a very familiar passage for many people. Here it says, weeping may last through the night. But joy comes in the morning, and that is certainly good news. That's good to hear and good to know 
that number one, we may have a weeping season. We may have a time when our heart's broken, our spirits might be broken, we're going through a difficult season in life, and so the weeping is going to happen. That's a night season event. That's something that when we're going through a difficult time, we're going through a bad uh, time in our lives, and so the weeping is going to occur. That brokenness is going to happen, and it's a good thing for that to happen. Because once we're able to release that and we go through our weeping season, we go through the the nighttime of, of despair and discouragement and disappointment, thanks be to God that the morning season comes. And by morning, I'm talking about M-O-R-N-I-N-G. And so that morning time, that daybreak season, the time when the night has lifted and the dawn of a new day now arrives. And it says there, that even though weeping may last through the night season, joy, thanks be to God, will come in the morning. At the dawn of a new day, God will provide joy for the one who had been weeping through the night season. And what that lets me know is that trouble does not last always. God is the God of relief. He is the God of restoration. And he is the God who brings us through our night season to the dawning of a brand new day. Also, if you go to Psalm 34, and there in the 34th Psalm, we're going to look at verse 18, and here it declares, the Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. Once again, God understands and he recognizes us who go through difficult seasons. Those of us who are having difficult times, regardless of what the nature of that difficulty might be. But he not only recognizes it, but he saves us. He restores us in the midst of us being crushed in our spirits. When we feel like there's nowhere to turn and we feel like we're standing in front of a closed door, there's no relief. God is the God who provides that restoration and that relief. We find that also in the 46th Psalm. And there in the 46th Psalm, we're going to look at verses 1 and 2. And again, looking at the New International Version. Psalm 46, 1 and 2. And again, this is a familiar passage for many of us. It says, God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of of the sea. Our God, our loving and gracious and compassionate God is our refuge and our strength. Our God is all powerful. He is omnipotent. He is omniscient. He knows everything. So there's nothing that's held secret from him. So he is thoroughly aware of what we go through. And therefore, he is our refuge. And a refuge is a hiding place, a place of safety. So God is our safety, and he is our strength. And it says that he is an ever-present help. He is always on duty. He knows what we're going through, and he does not leave us to fend for ourselves. He is the God who is the ever-present help in trouble. And therefore, no matter how bad our circumstances might be, no matter how difficult things are, And no matter how discouraging the circumstances might appear in light of what we're dealing with. And that's why that second verse says, Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea. And that's just giving reference to how bad things might get. It does not matter because our God is always an ever-present help in time of trouble. And so as we continue on, we're going to now go to the 48th Psalm. And we are systematically matriculating through the Psalms, and we're now at Psalm 48, and we're going to look at verse 14. And now in the 14th verse of the 48th Psalm, again from the NIV, there it reads, For this God is our God forever and ever. He will be our guide even to the end. And again, that is an encouraging word. That's an inspiring word. That this God, this God of heaven and earth, the God of creation, the God of restoration, 
and the God of salvation. This God is our God, and he is our God, not just for a period of time, but he is our God forever and ever. It also goes on to say that he will be our guide. God will, will lead us, and he'll show us how to navigate the difficult seasons in our life, those crying seasons, those night seasons that the psalm just spoke about. God helps us to navigate our way through those difficult times in life, those times of despair, discouragement, and disappointment, and he will be our guide, not just for a period, but he will be our guide even unto the end. He will make sure that he's with us from the very beginning to the very end of our season to the end of our very lives. God continues to be our ever-present help in times of trouble. Another psalm I want to re uh, re refer to you to is the 55th Psalm. And in Psalm 55, go with me to the 22nd verse. Psalm 55 and verse 22. I'm giving you all of these passages so that you know that the Scriptures confirm that we need to learn how to engage in good grief. And good grief is when you're able to recognize your circumstances, but know that God has not left us by ourselves, that he is the God who is always with us. He will never leave us, will never forsake us. And therefore, in the midst of my difficult seasons, I can positively, I can very definitively navigate my way through my difficult times, and that's what's called good grief. Again, we're looking at Psalm 55, and we're going to look at the 22nd verse, and there it says, cast your cares on the Lord, and he will sustain you. He will never let the righteous be shaken. Now, that's some good things right here, because notice what it says. It's giving us direction. It says to cast our cares, our worries, our concerns our disappointments, our despair, and our disgust. Cast those things on to the Lord. In other words, just have a little talk with Jesus. Just tell him all about it and allow God to be the foundation of where we lay those burdens unto the Lord. And it says, cast our cares on the Lord. And the reason why is because he will sustain us. He will support us. He will encourage us. He will allow us to walk boldly through whatever circumstance we find ourselves in. And when God sustains us, that means that he will provide the very means for our success. No matter what it is, no matter how long of a season we may be going through or how dark of a season, place those cares upon the Lord. He will not only sustain us, but he will never let the righteous be shaken. That means no matter what we're going through, he will never, ever, ever allow us to be shaken to the point where we're going to be in despair, where we're just going to be fretting over our circumstances, and that we're not going to be able to make it successfully through our environment, that environment of difficulty, that environment of trial, that environment of, of being disappointment disappointed, God will allow us to walk boldly and firmly, holding on to his unchanging hand, that he will never, ever, ever let the righteous be shaken. The righteous might go through some difficult seasons. Yes, we may go through some storms. Yes, we may go through some times where in the night season we cry, but we'll never, ever be shaken, meaning that our foundation will remain firm, and we're not going to be blown about by every wind of doctrine, but we can stand firm on the very foundation of God's Word, His presence, and His strength. He is an ever-present help in troubled times. The last psalm that I want to bring to your attention this evening is Psalm 71. And in that 71st psalm, go to verses 20 and 21. Psalm 71, verses 20 and 21. Again, I'm giving you some very definitive passages that help you to engage in good grief. Psalm 71, verses 20 and 21, there it reads... Though you have made me see troubles, many and bitter, you will restore my life again. From the depths of the earth, 
you will bring again me up. You will increase my honor and comfort me once more. Again, very powerful, very encouraging words here. Here the psalmist speaks directly to God and he says, Though you may have seen or made me to see troubles, you have made me see troubles. God will allow us to go through some troubled times. Just because we are children of God, just because we belong to the body of Christ, and just because we are Christians does not exempt us from going through trouble, through going through times. Jesus himself said, just as I suffer, you also will suffer. So suffering and going through troubles is part of the Christian program. If we've given our lives to Christ and if we've claimed him as our Lord and Savior, part of that process means that we're going to see some trouble. And that's a good thing because we'll never learn how to deal with trouble and to overcome them if we never go through them. And so here he says, you have made me to see troubles. And notice what he says. He qualifies these troubles. He says that these troubles are many and they're bitter. So he's talking about the variety and the complexity as well as the extent of the kinds of trouble, the intensity of the trouble. So we're going to go through many kinds of trouble. We're going to go through different kinds of intensities of trouble. It is an absolute certainty that every child of God is going to experience some trouble. If you're walking through life and you never face difficult times, you never experience trouble, then you might need to check your salvation status because every child of God is going to go through some trouble. Now, that trouble is not to defeat us, to destroy us, but it's to help develop us. It's to strengthen us. We go through these troubles that we may be made stronger. But look at what he says here. He says, you've made me to see trouble. Those troubles are going to be bitter, many and they're going to be bitter. But you will restore my life again. That's a promise. That is an absolute certainty. God will restore my life again from the very depths of the earth. Again, you will bring me up. So no matter how down or how low we may get, no matter how discouraged we may become, or how distraught we may be, God will restore us and he will bring us up again, even from the very depths of the earth. And then look at verse 21. He says, you will increase my honor and you will comfort me once more. So people will sometimes look at us when we're going through a difficult time and, and they may have chiding things to say. They may have discouraging things to say. Well, you're a Christian and you're going through such a difficult, kind, difficult time. What, what kind of God do you serve? Well, you know what? There's going to be times when we're going to go through those difficulties. But I guarantee you, if you continue to look to the hills where your help comes from and continue to hold on to God's unchanging hand, that hand that brings us through the fire and allows us to get on the other side of our difficult seasons, the Bible says, the Word of God declares that God will increase my honor and he will restore us and comfort us once more. And again, those are encouraging words. Those are true words from the psalm writer because he's experienced going through some difficult times. And just as God did that with the psalm writers, he will do it with us just as well. So no matter what you're facing today, no matter what you're going through, God will help to restore you and he will raise you up and restore your honor among men. Now I'd like to take you to another Old Testament passage. Now we're getting ready to get out of the Psalms, but I want to encourage you to go with me to Isaiah, the 25th chapter. And here the prophet Isaiah has something very powerful to say. There in the 8th verse, there, <coughs> excuse me, there in verse 8 from the 25th chapter of Isaiah, he says, He will swallow up death forever. The sovereign Lord will wipe away the tears from all faces. He will remove his people's disgrace from all the earth. The Lord hath spoken. Isaiah says that God will swallow up death forever. Now, we're going to face physical death. 
And those of us who don't face physical death, the only reason why we may not face it is because we may be alive when the rapture happens, when Jesus Christ comes back again. But for all practical purposes, unless we're caught up in the rapture while we're living, then we're going to face death. But it says that God will swallow up death forever. We will not have to deal with death because even if we die in this life, we are going to be in the very presence of our God and we'll never deal with death again. And so he says that God will swallow up death forever. The child of God will not have to suffer the pangs of death. But he goes on to say that the sovereign Lord will wipe away the tears from all faces. My face, your face, all of our faces, those of us who have surrendered our lives to Christ will have the tears wiped away from our eyes. And what that deals with is it means that we will encounter relief from all suffering. There will not be uh, the trial and the trauma and the turmoil of suffering because God will wipe away the tear from all faces. And he goes on to say that he will remove his people's disgrace from all of the earth. Any kind of disgrace that we may have encountered, any kind of, of uh, repudiation that we may have encountered, any kind uh, of despair or discouragement uh, that, that we've encountered, God will wipe that away and he will remove it from all of his people across the earth, those who have given our lives to Jesus Christ. We will not face the disgrace. We will not face that despair. And notice the punctuation that Isaiah says, he says, the Lord hath spoken. And that is confirmation that God is true to his word. He never, ever falls short of his word. Now I'd like to encourage you to look at some New Testament passages with me. We're going to go into the very first book of the New Testament, the book of Matthew. And in Matthew, we're going to look at verse 4 out of the fifth chapter. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 4 is a short verse, but it's a very impactful verse. There it reads, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Now, this comes right out of our Lord Jesus' Sermon on the Mount Discourse, and he gives this liturgy of those who are blessed. And he says here, blessed are those who mourn, those who are broken in their spirit, those who experience despair, discouragement, and or disappointment. And so God calls them blessed. And there are people who try to uh, escape experiencing despair, discouragement, or disappointment. But notice what Jesus says, and these are his own words. He said, blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are those who go through times of discouragement, disappointment, disillusionment, despair, or discouragement. He said, these are people who are blessed. And he says, you're blessed because you will be comforted. And that just lets us know that Jesus understands what we're going through. He is fully aware of what we're going through. And he allows us to go through it for our development, for our maturation, and for our growth. But even in light of that, he will bring a spirit of comfort to each and every child of God that goes through a mourning period. When we go through that disappointment or we encounter discouragement, or we deal with times of despair in our lives, God says, Jesus says, that even though you go through that, I'm going to bring a spirit of comfort. And that lets us know that our God never leaves us. He never forsakes us. He loves the righteous, and he brings a spirit of comfort to every child of God that goes through a mourning season. Now, if you go with me to the book of Romans... And in Romans, the eighth chapter, our reading is going to be a little lengthy. We're going to begin at verse 31, and we will conclude with verse 39. Romans, the eighth chapter, beginning at verse 31, concluding with verse 39. And there it reads, What then shall we say in response to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him 
graciously give us all things. I want to just pause for a moment and just kind of deal with that. Because here he says, what in response to these things, where if you look a couple passages before that, there it talks about how all things work together for good to those who love God and are called according to his purpose. And so there it lets us know that all things, the difficulties, the discouragements, the disappointments, and even the matters of despair, all the things have a purpose. And they work together for the good for those who do love God and those who are called according to his purpose. So he's talking about these things. What should we say in response to these things? That if God is for us, and we certainly know that God is for us. Well, how do we know that God is for us? Because we know that God loved us so much that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him will not perish, but will have a life everlasting. So we know that God is for us because he gave us Christ Jesus, that we might have the gift of everlasting life and that we might have life more abundant. So knowing that God is for us is not a question. We know that he's for us. And it says, if God is for us, which we know he is, then who can stand against us? Nobody can stand against us. Those of us who are saved, those of us who have given our lives to Jesus Christ, then we know that God is for us, and therefore, who can be against us? For he who did not spare his own son, speaking of God, but gave him up for us all, how he will not also, along with him, graciously give us all things. And so I just kind of wanted to walk us through that beginning portion of that 8th chapter, verses 31 through 32. Now, notice what it says. And he's making a point by asking questions. And these questions help us to recognize some very definitive theological truths, some doctrinal truths regarding how God relates to those of us who are saved. He says, who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen. We have been chosen in Christ. He goes on to say, it is God who justifies. Verse 34, he goes on and says, who then is the one who condemns? No one. Jesus Christ or Christ Jesus who died more than that, who has raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Don't miss that, beloved. The same one who ascended to the right hand of God after he died on the cross, was resurrected from the grave, spent time uh, with witnesses that people would see that he actually resurrected from the grave. The very one who ascended from the Mount of Olives had given power and said to the saints that there's going to come a time when all power is going to be given to you. And this very one who now sits at the right hand of the Father, it's he who intercedes for each and every one of us. See, we need to understand that. We need to know that we're not just fending for ourselves, but our Lord Jesus is at this very moment sitting at the right hand of the Father, and he is pleading each and every one of our cases. When we're going through times of despair, when we're dealing with discouragement and disappointments in life, we don't have to feel like we're out here all by ourselves because Paul says that our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ who ascended to the right hand of the Father is right there sitting right next to God and he is pleading our case for God. He knows what we are in need of and so he is interceding for us. And when we're dealing with times of despair, disappointment, and discouragement, sometimes our hearts are so heavy Sometimes we're so weary with grief that we can't even mouth the words to even make a case for ourselves. But you know what? That's all right because Jesus is sitting right there for each and every one of us when we're too heartbroken. We're in too much despair and we're so broken that we can't even offer up a prayer. Guess what? Jesus is right there praying for us. He's making intercession for us. When all we can do is cry or we might be able to just groan or just shed a tear, Jesus is interpreting those tears, those moans, those groans so that God is able to understand. And he already knows what we're going through, but Jesus is right there pleading our case in light of our prayers unto God. 
I wanted to make that plain. I wanted you to understand that because sometimes people pray and there's times when people wonder, is my prayer even getting through? Is God even hearing my prayer? Is God even understanding my prayer? But I just want to confirm and I want to affirm that not only does God hear your prayers, God understands your prayers, and God is in the midst of answering those prayers because Jesus is sitting right next to him interceding on our behalf. Notice what it says in verse 35. He said, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship, persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? All of those circumstances do not have the capacity to separate us from the very love of God. No matter what you're going through. No matter how long you're going through it, no matter what the nature of what you're going through, no matter what the degree of what you're going through, there is nothing that separates us from the love of Christ. Whether it's trouble, whether it's hardship, whether it's persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword, there is nothing. Because look at what it says in verse 36. As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor death, nor anything else in creation, will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Somebody ought to shout hallelujah for that because it tells us that there is nothing in earth, nothing above the earth, nothing that we face, nothing that we've been through, nothing that we're encountering now, nothing that we're going to face in the future. There is absolutely nothing, not angels, not demons, not things present, not things past, not things that you're going to go through. There is absolutely nothing that can separate you, separate me, separate us from the very love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's how you go through good grief. When you know that you're not able to be separated from the love of God, that nobody can separate us from the love of Christ Jesus. Nothing can keep us from the very loving and compassionate and provisionary safety and love of our God. And that's good grief grief. In spite of what you're dealing with, you know that you've got a God that loves you and a God that is going to keep you and hold you in the very hollow of his hands and sustain you no matter what we go through. That's good grief. And that's how to get victory over your despair, your discouragement, and your disappointment. All right, have a couple of more passages here before we close. Go with me to the book of Hebrews. And in Hebrews, we're going to look at chapter 4. Again, I'm giving you, these are power verses. These are power passages. And I want you to write these down and keep them for your reference. So whenever you find yourself, not if ever, but when you find yourself going through, you can refer to these, and these can be words of encouragement for your soul. Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 through 16. Look at what it says. Therefore... Since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, and I just told you a few moments ago how Jesus, after his death, his burial, his resurrection, how he ascended from the right, he ascended from the Mount of Olives to the right hand of the Father. So here it says, therefore, since we have a great high priest, and that's who Jesus is, he's our great high priest who has ascended into the heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses. But we have one who has been tempted in every way just as we are. Yet he did not sin. Thanks be to God. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. 
Somebody ought to be shouting. Somebody ought to be dancing because of that. Because that's some good stuff. That's good truth right there. That's good grief material. Because what it says is that Jesus, who is our great high priest, and we think about what a priest is. A priest is that person who intercedes on behalf of his people to God. A prophet on the, other side, on the other side of the same coin is the one who declares God's word to the people. But a priest is one who goes up and he intercedes to God on behalf of the people. Jesus is our great high priest. He's the one who is above every priest. He is the one who is the very son of God. He is the Messiah. He's the one who came to give his life for us and to intercede and to make intercession unto God on our behalf. And so because he is the high priest, he ascended to heaven. He's at the right hand of God. He's identified as Jesus, the son of God, the son of God. And we ought to hold firmly to the faith that we profess. That means no matter what anybody says, no matter what anybody does, that the faith that we have in Christ Jesus, that he is the son of God, we hold tightly to that. We hold firmly to that because that is the faith that we profess. In spite of what goes on in life, what goes on in the world, what goes on with respect to any religiosity, we hold firm to the faith that we profess in Christ Jesus. And notice what he says in verse 15. He says that we do not have a high priest who is unable to emphasize with our weaknesses. Jesus knows. I've said it before. I'll say it again. He understands what we go through. And the reason why is because we do not have one who has not been tempted in every way. He has been tempted in every way that we have been tempted, just as we are, yet he did not sin. That lets us know that not only does he understand, not only does he have the capability and the desire to empathize with what we go through because he went through it too, but he did not sin, which means he has the power to strengthen us, encourage us, and empower us in the midst of the trial, the disappointment, discouragement, and despair that we encounter. Well, I'm trying to really gird up your loins here because he says that even though we've been tempted, he also has been tempted in every way, but he did not sin which now means that he has the ability to lift us up out of our circumstances. Verse 16 says, Then let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence, which means no matter what we're going through, we can trust, we can understand that because we have a high priest who is interceding on our behalf because he's gone through the same things we've gone through yet without sinning, that he is there at the right hand of God interceding for us, making our case and letting us know that in spite of what we encounter, that we can come to the throne of God with confidence because Jesus is right there meeting us and interceding on our behalf so that we can come and reconcile can receive mercy and we can receive grace in our time of need which means we don't have to despair we don't have to be saddened or we don't have to be discouraged because in light of what we're going through I can go to the very throne of God knowing that Jesus is right there to meet me and that he's going to go with me unto God and therefore I can receive grace I can receive mercy I can receive comfort I can receive love I can receive power because right there at the throne of God is Jesus right there with me interceding on my behalf again that helps me to have good grief knowing that in spite of what I'm dealing with I've got a savior right there who's going to meet me at the throne of grace of God and there I can receive mercy and I can receive grace in the time of my trouble that is good news beloved and we need to rejoice because God provided Jesus Christ to be there for us in our time of need now we're going to go to our last passage for the night. And that last passage is Revelation chapter 21. And we're going to end with this verse, verse 4. And this verse, this is a, now all of these have been high note verses, but this is especially a high note verse here. Revelation chapter 21, the fourth verse, again, NIV, here it reads, He, and he being Jesus Christ, will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning 
or crying or pain. For the older or the old order of things have passed away. That is cause for celebration. We're going to cry tears. We're going to have our weeping in the night seasons. And the scripture tells us that. We saw that in Psalms. But in spite of that, that time is going to come when he will wipe away every tear from our eyes. Every brokenhearted, every downtrodden, every discouraged person, every child of God that is going through a difficult season, our God is going to wipe away every tear from our eyes. There's going to be no more death, no more mourning, no more crying, no more pain, for the old order of things have passed away and a brand new order of celebration and truth will then reign. And beloved, we are so thankful that our God has prearranged that he's wiping the tears away from every eye, every discouraged, every disappointed, and every discouraged eye. He wipes away those tears because that old order of pain and suffering will then pass away and a new order will come to pass. Beloved, I pray that your hearts were encouraged this evening and I pray that you've gained a sense of hope and a sense of encouragement and inspiration because God would have us to engage in good grief. Remember, it was never God's purpose for you, any of us to walk around with our heads hung low in discouragement, despair, and disappointment, but to walk with our heads held high, even in the midst of our trials, because our God is a triumphant God. He is the God that brings victory out of trial, and he allows us to walk with our hand in his hand, knowing that he is right there with us at all times. May your hearts be encouraged until the next time we come together on next Wednesday with our Bible study, how God gives us victory over despair, discouragement, and disappointment. Let's close our time with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word tonight. We thank you that you give us victory over despair, discouragement, and disappointment. You are the God who provides our every need, and you provide it through your riches and glory. So, Father, I pray that you would encourage, that you would inspire, and that you would walk with each and every person under the sound of my voice. Let them know that you are an all-gracious and all-loving God. For that, we give you our thanks and our praise. It's this prayer that we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Beloved, may God bless you. May God keep you to the time that we can get together next time. Please join me again on Sunday mornings at 1015 right here at Spirit of New Ministries. And we look forward again seeing you on next Wednesday as we continue our Bible study. May God bless you. May God keep you as our prayer. We'll see you again right here at Spirit of New Ministries. Joy.